We're going to invite anyone from the Visioning Leadership Team who would like to join us on these stools. And we've asked Jim Van Zant, one of our team members, to uh, lift up some of the questions that we've been hearing about the report. And we, our thought is if we can answer those questions before you have to get up and ask them, we're doing you a favor. <laughs> All right, well, greetings, gang. Glad you're here today. I want to ask you this very first question right off the top. Why do we need to do this? <laughs> well, I'll go. I think Bishop Lowry answered that for us this morning. As we strive to refocus on the purpose, structure is a part of that. I think one of my great heartaches at General Conference as we went through the debate on structure was to listen to people debate about saving their seat rather than living the mission. I think as we strive to be faithful as an annual conference, this isn't the cure-all, <laughs> but I think it helps us to keep mission and purpose first. I heard the word representative, I think, in the presentation, that the structure we have now is highly representative. Is that going to change in this new structure? I can speak to it just a, a little bit. I, I think I might already. <laughs> I didn't mean that personally, Mike. I, uh, <laughs> I, I think the thing, Jim, that really excites me about this is that um, as much as we want to hear as many voices represented on these tables and to make sure that we, uh, you know, have a fairness there, I think more importantly, we need people with passion for that particular ministry to be sitting around that table and to be able to work together, not to say, I want this to happen for my people back here, but rather, I want this to happen because we see God leading us all in this vision together. So I think when you hear non-representative, it means we want folks not there representing their own interests, but rather, we want people there representing God's interest and in where we want to go together. Great way to put it. So it's a different focus of the representation that you're talking about. But with that, there's a fear that some of the things that have been important to us in the past and important to the structure may get lost. How do we see that that doesn't happen? One of the things that I was struck by at General Conference this year is many times we we ended up focusing on so many different causes that at the end of the day, it almost felt like there was actually no room for the God of those causes. And so what we're starting to discover is that we can instead invert that, where if our focus is on Jesus Christ and living into Jesus Christ, that naturally is going to allow for all those other causes to be cared for. Because as Christians, of course we're going to care for our women and our older and our younger and our youth and everyone else. But when we invert that, and elevate those causes above the status of God, then it gets all chaotic and everybody worries about having their voice heard. So if instead our focus remains on Christ, all of those other natural causes will come flowing out and they'll be met as we trust one another in that pursuit. Amen, indeed. One of, the, one of our United Methodist words is connectionalism. How's that preserved in this? Oh, I just love the word connectionalism. <laughs> Um, it is the one thing that is really unique to United Methodism, I believe. Um, we're, you know, there's, there's one church, the body of Christ. The Christian church, part of that body. Uh, the United Methodist Church is part of that body. The annual conference is a part of that body. And the local church is a part of that body as well. Uh, but we are one church. And we're able to share resources in ways that other, uh, other church families cannot. Uh, we also believe that it's a covenantial relationship, and that's one of the goals that we have. We think that connectionalism can be revived in such a way uh, in, the next, in the, the next coming years uh, that uh, it's really going to, uh, to be an exciting way to, to spread um, the gospel uh, in, in the communities in which we live. Uh, we, <laughs> uh, what do I want to say? There are so many people who think that connectionalism 
has you know has gone 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 away. We don't need it anymore. But it really is that at this point in this time in history, we have the kind of gifts through our connectionalism that it will take for the church to be effective. Will your church be? What was the question? Will your church be effective in the kind of world that we have? And and we think we can as a connectional church. May may I add something to that? <clears throat> Excuse me, and suggest a couple chapters in the book of Acts that have come to mean a good bit to me lately, and that is the 11th chapter and the 15th chapter. Read both of those with in mind what we believe about connectionalism. I think it would have been difficult for, to talk to the Apostle Paul about an independent approach to being the church. Uh, connectionalism is very uniquely Methodist, and I wish we would rediscover that because that's our power suit as far as I'm concerned, and it's come to mean a lot to me lately. One more question. This is a math question. You oh, talk no. about yeah. <laughs> you talk about these uh, six ministry teams, but I'm looking at this and I only see five circles. I'm not brilliant, but I can figure out that that doesn't quite add up. Where's the sixth one? <laughs> that one's easy. I can handle that one. Um, the visioning leadership team, which has been around for two years now, we are also. Terrible twos, terrific twos. Uh, that's a 16. All right. Thanks for being here for the few minutes to answer a couple of questions. I'm sure your folks are going to have more, and you'll have an opportunity to ask.